book. Um, so we're going to start off by talking about common functions of problem behavior. Then we're going to go into functional behavior assessment, so ways that you can determine why your client is engaging in problem behavior. Um, then we're going to do some role play, which will be really fun. We'll be breaking off into small groups and just kind of practicing both being the kid and the tech. Um, and then we're going to do a Kahoot, and then we're going to do a quiz. So we have a lot of activities today, so we're trying to make it more hands-on just because I'll talk about this a little bit later, but we don't get to do functional behavior assessments in the form of functional analyses while at West Campus. So getting to practice it and getting more experience with it in here should hopefully suffice for that. So we'll see. Uh, so first we're going to talk about functions of behavior. A function of behavior, oh my gosh, okay, hold on. I have the guided notes pulled up. This is, this is not my day. means why your behavior is occurring. So what in the environment is causing that behavior to happen? Some common functions for most problem behaviors include access to tangibles, access to attention, escape from demands, and automatic reinforcement. So there's obviously other types of things that could be maintaining behavior, but these are the typical functions that you will see with your kids. Uh, so the first one we'll talk about is access to tangibles. So this is when the client engages in a behavior to gain access to a tangible. So this could be the tangible is out of reach, so they try to get to it, you block them, they engage in problem behavior to get to that tangible. It could be you say my turn, they try to get your hand away to keep access to that tangible. So it could be in a variety of different forms, but essentially the whole basis is that they're engaging in that behavior to get that tangible. So one example is if the client does not have a doll that they prefer, they headbang, and now they do have that doll. So that can show why someone might engage in that self-interest behavior. Um, attention is when the client engages in a behavior to gain access to attention, it should be noted that it can be in the form of like positive versus negative attention. So while a reprimand saying like don't do that or no might seem like it would be aversive to most people, some of your clients might actually find that reinforcing. So that's one important thing to look at. Even if you think you're like punishing a behavior, you might actually be reinforcing it. Um, so no attention. So again, it could be in the form of you're like working on data, you're talking to your BCBA or program specialist, you're just doing something that prevents you from giving attention to the client. Um, they headbang and now they have attention. The attention could be in multiple forms. It could be that reprimand, it could be some kind of praise like, are you okay, what's happening, something along those lines. Um, so attention can be in a variety of forms. Um, with escape, that's when the client engages in a behavior to escape from a demand, which is probably something all of you guys have seen at West Campus. Uh, so one example would be if the text hand was raised while saying high five, so that's a demand put into place. Um, the client had bangs, and now the text hand is no longer um, in place to give a high five. So basically the headbang um, serves as a way for them to escape that demand. And then the final one we'll talk about specifically is automatic reinforcement. So this is when the client engages in a behavior because it's automatically reinforcing, so it's like self-stimulation. Um, some examples can include hand flapping, some self-interest behaviors can even be automatically reinforcing like head banging, for example. Um, so the typical contingency that you use with this would be no sensory stimulation, the client head bangs, and now they have sensory stimulation. Um, so this is an interesting one because it can be for both behaviors that you would expect to be sensory stimulating, so like hand flapping, something you would expect to be, but also a self-interest behavior that can also sometimes be maintained by automatic reinforcement. So even if you see a behavior that, again, you don't think would be automatically reinforcing, it can always be a possibility. Okay, so any questions about functions of behavior? I know this is, that this is all stuff that we talked about in 1400, so it might be kind of redundant. Okay. So now we're gonna talk about functional behavior assessments. Uh, so these are what is used to determine the function of a behavior. Um, the functional behavior assessment is an umbrella term that encompasses three different techniques that are used. Uh, the formal definition for it is a systematic method of assessment for obtaining information about the purposes or functions a problem behavior serves for a person. So essentially, 
you're using this, this type of assessment to figure out why your client is engaging in a problem behavior. And once you have the results of your assessment, you will use them to guide your intervention. So you'll put an intervention in place that you'll use to either decrease that problem behavior or increase kind of replacement behavior for the problem behavior. So like I said, it's an umbrella term and it encompasses three different assessment methods. That includes indirect observations, descriptive assessments, and functional analyses. Um, so we've talked a little bit already about um, indirect observations and descriptive assessments. Um, so I won't go too in depth about those. We're mostly going to focus on the functional analyses for today, but I still wanted to cover the other two just so you get like a full view of how you could assess problem behavior. Um, so for today, we're going to talk about, well, for right now, we're going to talk about indirect observations first. So does anyone remember what an indirect observation is from previous classes? So if you're assessing behavior, without it being direct, yeah. Um, you don't necessarily see or watch it occur, but you're <coughs> like receiving information about it from some other source. Yeah, exactly. So with indirect observation, you're obtaining information without directly observing the behavior. Um, the way that you do this is by conducting interviews, rating scales, checklists, questionnaires, and other methods. Um, so what you're doing is you are assessing the behavior through other people's experiences and perspectives. Um, so that typically involves doing them with parents, teachers, caregivers, other people who frequently are with the client. Um, it also can involve doing it with the client themselves if they have the verbal ability to communicate with you and tell, them, tell you why they're engaging in these behaviors. But essentially, you're seeing it from their perspective. You're asking them to, from memory, tell you what instances the client's most likely to engage in problem behavior and what's most likely to happen after the problem behavior. So one of the main things that people typically do with indirect observations is interviews. Uh, this allows you to gain information about a lot of things. Uh, for one, antecedents and consequences to behavior. Um, so you can ask the parent, teacher, caregiver, whoever it is, what typically happens before the behavior and what typically happens after the behavior. Um, this is super beneficial for behaviors that are occurring at times where you're not able to be present. It gets so quiet in here when that turns off. I feel like I'm talking really loud. Um, so like if the client engages in a lot of problem behavior during like their bedtime routine, for example, when you're not able to be present, being able to ask mom or dad about what happens right before the problem behavior, what happens after, that can give you more insight to those scenarios where you're not able to be present. Um, also, topography of behavior. So topography refers to what the behavior looks like. So again, the parents or teachers are spending more time with the client than you are, so they're seeing different variations of head banging or different ways that flopping or aggression might look. So they can kind of give you an overall view of what the behavior could look like in different scenarios. So that's always beneficial to know, so you know what to expect, kind of. Um, and then frequency of behavior. So again, I keep going back to that fact that they're with the client a lot more than you are. Um, they can let you know how often it's occurring, how much it's coming into the way of their daily activities, and just kind of give you a view of what their behavior looks like outside of your sessions with them. Um, and then goals that the interviewee would like to work on. So an important fact is that when you're doing these interviews, even if it's supposed to focus on functions of behavior, you can also gain other information, such as like the goals that the parent wants to work on. Um, so a lot of the time with the problem behavior, it's getting in the way of other things that the parents would like to be doing. So they can talk to you about the problem behavior and talk to you about the goals that they would like while working with their, with their child. Um, and then skills, preferences, and reinforcers. Um, again, this is information that is beneficial just for intervention planning in general. Uh, you'll need to know what skills, preferences, or reinforcers are going to be able to be used while teaching them these new behaviors. So getting that information firsthand from someone who obviously spends so much time with them is helpful. Uh, so during interviews, you can ask a variety of questions. Um, one could be, how does he communicate with you guys? Does he point to things, vocally ask for things, etc.? Um, a lot of the time when you plan interventions to decrease, decrease problem behavior, you're typically teaching a communication response to replace that problem behavior. So it's important to know how often they're communicating at home independently or spontaneously, how they are communicating so that you can use that in your programming. You don't wanna use a communication method that's not going to work at home. 
Uh, so getting that information from mom or dad or the teacher, for, ex for example, would be really helpful for intervention planning. Um, what do his problem behaviors look like? How frequent are they? What happens directly before he engages in this behavior? What happens directly after? Um, questions like these tend to get vague answers from whoever you're interviewing. We've talked about this in a previous class, I think it was data collection, where when you're interviewing these people, they're typically people who don't have experience analyzing behavior. So because of this, you probably have to have these follow-up questions. So mom might say, he tantrums a lot. You should say, what does tantruming look like? What is the, how long does this tantrum last? What kind of behaviors is he engaging in that make you think he's tantruming? So just kind of getting as much information as you can and trying to get more details than leaving it in a big spot. Um, so what are some goals we'd like to work on in the future? Um, this is a really, really important one. Um, so what methods have you guys tried in the past? So say you get a client who's eight years old, just moved to town, had behavioral services for four years prior. Um, you should have an idea of what they've tried before. So they might have spent a lot of time working on this certain skill, and they tried different methods, and none of these methods worked. That can give you insight that you might want to try a different method first, or give you insight that you should contact their BCBA, BCBA or behavior analyst to figure out kind of like what programming they were using. So basically with getting this information, you're saving some time, you're getting some ideas about the client in general, getting some ideas about future directions for interventions, and just kind of getting like a really good overview of your client. Okay, and then rating skills is another form of indirect observation. Um, so this involves asking informants to rate the extent to which the behavior occurs across a scale. Uh, the scale is typically written as like never, sometimes, always, so it's pretty vague. Um, it's just asking them about the frequency of behavior, under what conditions behavior is going to occur. Um, so the point of these scales is that you'll gain a hypothesis, and this is kind of the same also with the interviews. Um, you're gaining hypotheses or ideas about why behavior is occurring, or under what conditions behavior is likely to occur. So with the rating scale, I'm gonna show you guys an example in a moment, but basically after the rating, you'll look at the behave the like conditions, antecedents, and consequences that have the highest rate of occurring according to the person who's filling out the rating scale, and then that can be a possible hypothesis that you can test later. Um, so example, if the informant rates items related to client engaging in problem behavior after a demand has been placed as always, this is a possible hypothesis that the client engages in behavior to escape those demands. I don't know if you guys were able to read like, any of this. Kind of. Um, so this is one rating scale that Iwata and his colleagues, I don't remember who else did it, um, they made um, this rating scale in order to assess behavior in that indirect sense. For this rating scale specifically, they were also using this to conduct a functional analysis, which we'll discuss later. Um, but basically, you can see it's pretty vague. Um, they list a bunch of different things, and then it's just yes, no, not applicable. Um, so even though it's vague, as long as you have a follow-up assessment, it can be pretty useful, um, especially when just trying to come up with ways that behavior might be occurring, so like hypotheses and whatnot. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about descriptive assessments. Again, I'm gonna keep this pretty short because we've gone over descriptive assessments, I think, once or twice before. Um, so does anyone remember what a descriptive assessment is? We also might have referred to it as a direct observation. So if you're, if an indirect observation is when you're not observing behavior but gaining information, what could a direct be? Yeah. So it involves when you're directly observing the client in their natural environment. Uh, so that's gonna be a key point when comparing this with functional analyses next. Uh, but you're not contriving situations or manipulating the environment. So basically the client in their natural environment, you're trying to be as discreet as possible. You don't want to interrupt or disrupt the way that their everyday life goes. You just kind of want to be there to take data. Um, so it often involves taking ABC data. Um, has anyone taken ABC data yet this week? Okay, cool. So everyone should have, not everyone, most of you guys should have some pretty good exposure to it already. Um, but basically, it's just writing those antecedents, behaviors, and consequences that you're seeing related to problem behavior and sometimes to compliance behaviors, depending on what you're focusing on. Uh, but for functional behavior assessments, you're typically looking at the problem behaviors. Um, so just looking at what happens before the problem behavior, what happens after, and what that behavior specifically looks like. 
Um, so again, this is a way that you can come up with these hypotheses um, that are about why the behavior is occurring. So what situations are the behavior most likely to occur in? What's most likely to happen after the behavior? And that just kind of gives you insight into what can be causing the behavior. Okay, so before we go into functional analyses, are we all cool with the two that we went over? Okay. Okay, so a forewarning, functional analyses are gonna seem weird because it kind of goes against everything that you're like taught to do. Um, but this assessment method can be really, really beneficial, especially for behaviors that have an unclear function or behaviors that are really dangerous or really disruptive. So bear with me, even though it's gonna sound kind of weird. So, you systematically manipulate variables in the environment to determine what is maintaining the behavior. So this involves that you have these hypotheses that you most likely gained from those two previous assessments, um, and you're going to arrange environmental conditions to try to evoke problem behavior. So I'm gonna break down this more into detail, but just for now to summarize it, um, if you think attention is maintaining a problem behavior, one of your conditions could be attention where you're trying to evoke problem behavior by withholding attention until problem behavior occurs. And we're gonna watch videos, so I know that sounds just really off from what we usually do, but essentially this involves setting up the environment to evoke problem behavior and then reinforcing problem behavior. Just to see in what condition is problem behavior more likely to occur. So the condition that consistently has the highest occurrence of problem behavior is most likely the function of that behavior, so what's maintaining it. So when you're comparing a bunch of conditions, if one condition has a really high rate of problem behavior, it's likely that that's the function of the client's problem behavior. Uh, so the basic setup of an FA is that you'll have conditions selected based on hypotheses. Um, so like I said, with the descriptive and indirect observation assessment methods, um, you'll come up with hypotheses, so reasons why behavior might be occurring. Um, and then you'll put those into conditions and you'll expose the client to each condition a few different times. Um, so there should be breaks between conditions to prevent carryover effects. So essentially, if a client's having high rates of problem behavior in one condition, you don't want the next condition to start directly afterwards. They might engage in problem behavior just because they're still kind of amped up from the last condition. Um, so basically you have these conditions spread out throughout the day, having breaks between them. Um, each condition should be presented more than once. So like to any other data collection method, you want to have frequent data collection, you want to have frequent exposure so that you have that consistent data um, to make sure that you have the right function. Um, and then, so you do this functional analysis, and then you're gonna use those results to guide intervention. So even though you spent that short time period reinforcing problem behavior, you're not gonna use those results to decrease that problem behavior and reinforce an appropriate response that will take its place. So hopefully this will make it more clear, but the most common conditions that are included in FAs include contingent attention, contingent escape, and a loan condition, and a control condition. So we're gonna break down each of these, and then we're gonna watch an example video of um, two actors kind of playing out each condition. So contingent attention is if you suspect the function of the behavior is attention, you may include a contingent attention condition. Um, so this involves withholding attention until the client engages in problem behavior. So for example, you might be sitting there taking data or looking through papers, just doing anything but giving the client attention. Um, and then once they engage in problem behavior, you'll provide attention to the client. So if the target behavior, for example, was hidden, I would completely ignore the client until they hit me and then I would turn, provide attention for a short period of time and then go back to ignoring them. So attention is contingent on problem behavior. So always remember the consequence is contingent on the behavior. So attention does not happen unless they engage in the behavior of interest. So again, no attention, the client headbangs attention. Is this condition clear? Okay. So for contingent escape, uh, this involves presenting a demand or activity that you suspect may be the cause of an escape response. Uh, so you'll typically select demands that are that have a low probability of compliance. So if your client has a long history of loving to imitate other people, you probably will use imitation demands. Um, you would instead use a demand that might kind of have this history of being aversive or evoking problem behavior. Um, so you'll use, you'll use these demands um, that are going to evoke problem behavior. And then once they engage in problem behavior, you remove the demand. 
So say high fives are super aversive. I'll be with the client, I'll say high five, they hit me, that's the target behavior. I'll say, all right, you don't have to do a high five. And I take the demand away. So you're just kind of taking the demand away contingent on problem behavior again. So again, the consequence doesn't happen unless the problem behavior happens. So again, you have the demand in place, so it could be a high five, an invitation trial, just any demand that's aversive. The client headbangs, and now they no longer have to comply with the demand. Okay, cool, yeah. When you're doing this, like, are you just doing it for one session, or is it like a repetitive? So it depends. It can have different setups. What's common a lot of the time is to do a 10-minute <coughs> session of like solely focusing on each condition. So like 10 minutes of I'm just going to present demands and take them away contingent on the problem behavior. And then you'll typically expose them to each condition like three different times, um, just so that you have a stable rate of responding across conditions. But this wouldn't be like, a, like at West Campus, this wouldn't be like for three full hours, you're just like reinforcing everything. It would just be these set up um, like 10 minute or so conditions. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So in a loan condition, so this one's a little bit different from the other ones. Um, this involves removing social aspects and access to environmental stimuli. So essentially you want to make it so there's nothing for them to really interact with in the environment. Um, and the purpose of this, um, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. The purpose of this is to test for if it's automatically maintained. So if nothing's in the environment, if I'm sitting in a room that there's nothing in it, I headbang, nothing's going to change. So the only reason I would headbang is for automatic reinforcement. If you have nothing to interact with and you're still engaging in the problem behavior, and even like no one's even there to give you attention for it, then it's most likely automatically maintained. So going back to the previous bullet points, um, when the problem behavior happens, nothing in the, in the environment changes. The only possible outcome or consequence is automatic reinforcement. So if behavior occurs in the absence of antecedents and consequences that are delivered by another person, it is likely that it's automatically maintained. Um, so this would look like no sensory stimulation, head banged sensory stimulation. Does this one make sense? Because I know it's a little bit different from the other two. So basically, no consequences are delivered. They're just hanging out in that room or whatever area they're in for 10 minutes. So a control condition is a condition that will be used in every FA. It's kind of a way to get your baseline, get like ensuring that behavior won't occur under these circumstances. Uh, so this involves non-contingent and continuous access to reinforcers and attention. So they have all these fun toys on the table. You're giving them attention. That's usually reinforcing for them. Um, so they're not losing out on those reinforcers. And along with that, you're not presenting any demands. So basically, it should just be a really fun situation for your kid. They have free access. You are playing. You're not doing demands. It's all fun. Uh, so this is just kind of to show that if none of these so-called like, aversive situations are happening, the client should not be engaging in problem behavior. Um, so specific consequences are not delivered contingent on problem behavior. So say we're playing, I'm like hopping the horse, whatever, doing something weird, and the client hits me. I'm not gonna change anything I'm doing, I'm just gonna continue playing the way I was playing. It's kind of like extinction. Um, you're just gonna continue whatever you were doing before the, pro the problem behavior and just act like nothing's happening. So this differs from the alone condition because in the alone condition, they don't have access to anything, and in this condition, they have access to everything that they should want to have access to. So you're not withholding anything from them. Um, so again, this is like extinction of problem behavior. Um, so rates of problem behavior in this condition are usually low. Um, if they're not, it's something that your BCBA will probably take a second look at. Um, and we'll talk about results again later, but essentially this should be the most easy condition for your client, um, unless the behavior is automatically maintained or um, if there's other variables that prohibited the condition from being ran correctly. So we're gonna watch a video. <coughs> in this case of aggression. Uh, Jennifer Haddock will be playing the role of the client or student, and her target behavior is aggression, which consists of punching the therapist, uh, whose role is being played by Travis Jones. Now, uh, we'll begin with what we call the no interaction condition. 
And uh, in the interview, I described an alone condition, which is the condition that we would use for problem behavior uh, suspected to be maintained by automatic reinforcement. And the alone condition will be used for, let's say, self-injurious behavior or stereotypic behavior. Now, that condition is irrelevant for aggression because there can be no aggression in the alone condition, which is why we replace it with what we call the no interaction condition. Now, in that condition, uh, the client has access to leisure materials and can do what he or she pleases. No behavior produces any consequences by the therapist. So as we begin this condition, uh, we see Jennifer, the client, uh, reasonably playing appropriately with the toy. Uh, as you can see, she has engaged in an episode of aggressive behavior, but that produces no reaction on the part of the therapist as does any other behavior she exhibits. And so as the session continues, Jennifer engages in various responses, some of them consisting of appropriate play, some proper instruction, some aggression. Uh, regardless of what the behavior is, the therapist does not deliver any sort of attention. So this is basically a, a test condition to see if aggression maintains when nothing is happening. Now, this condition uh, is an example of what we call the attention condition. It's a test condition to see if problem behavior is maintained by social positive reinforcement, usually in the form of attention. Now, recall uh, that the antecedent event in this condition is no attention is available from the therapist for any behavior, except as a consequence for the target behavior. In this case, it is going to be aggression. Now, the way we typically start this session is to simply indicate to the individual that we, the therapist, will be busy and then completely ignore the individual from then on. Jennifer, you've got some toys there. Play with your toys. I've got some work to do. Ow, Jennifer, that's not nice. That's not how you make friends. Now Jennifer engaged in an episode of aggression. She struck the therapist. He delivered attention. Uh, next, she engaged in another inappropriate behavior, which is sort of proper destruction, throwing things. That's not the target behavior for this assessment, so it produces no social consequences. Alice, are you going to play with me this time? I figured out how to do the puzzle. Neither does appropriate behavior. Also, no consequences. Jennifer, that is not how we treat people. I don't feel hard. In this simulation, we will be seeing a series of conditions from a functional analysis. It
they do it like full screen or something? Does the general idea make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's like what you would do. I don't think I can get this to work right there. Okay. So the one thing that's kind of funky about that video is that um, for the alone condition, so if you have a behavior that relies on another person being there, you obviously can't do the alone condition the way it's typically written. Um, so for them, they tried to do it a little bit different. They did the same idea that nothing in the environment changes um, as a result of them engaging in problem behavior. Um, but like I talked about earlier, your loan condition will typically look like um, the client has access to literally nothing but their sensory stimula stimulatory behavior. Um, so now we're going to talk about interpreting FA results. Um, so this was one of the graphs that I pulled from my WADA's video. So the guy talking in the last video is one of the people who created functional analyses in general. Um, so this was kind of an example he gave of how you would interpret results. Um, so you can see with the top one, um, the highest one is the red one. Um, each data point represents one session. Um, so that's the rate of behavior occurring within that one session. So for the top graph, the highest one is attention. I don't have my glasses on, yeah, attention. <laughs> Um, so you would assume that the behavior is attention maintained. So if you're putting a client in a position where they don't get access to a reinforcer unless they engage in problem behavior, and that reinforcer is what's maintaining behavior and it's occurring at high rates, you can assume that that's what your function is. Um, so with the bottom left one, you can see it's escape, which they also call social negative reinforcement because you're removing something that you are doing. Um, and then the one to your right is automatic reinforcement. So the higher the rate of behavior in a condition, the more likely that that condition is what's maintaining your problem behavior. Yeah? So like if you're doing this, uh, let's say you're doing social negative reinforcement or like a you know, escape, would you run like four separate like trials, essentially like 10 minutes, where one of them you're only presenting the dance, one of them you're only doing play, and kind of like figure out how? So like are you saying how would you test each condition? Yeah. So it's kind of the way that they were showing it in the video. So for one 10 minute session, you are only targeting demands. Okay. Or for like five minutes or 10 minutes later after that break between sessions, now you're only gonna target attention. Um, so yeah, you most likely wouldn't intermix them just because it might kind of con like uh, get you confounding variables. Uh, so you usually would do one at a time. Um, so this can also happen. So results are all over the place. It's super unclear about what's maintaining the behavior. The behavior is occurring in all situations. Um, you would typically say that these results are inconclusive. Um, so there could have been a variety of things that happened incorrectly. You might not have had a long enough break between sessions, which could have caused carryover effects. Um, sessions might not have been um, conducted with treatment integrity. So there might have been accidental reinforcement in other forms in sessions. Um, also, though, another one that could be highly possible is that the behavior is automatically maintained. So it doesn't matter what's happening <coughs> in the environment, they're just going to engage in the behavior no matter what. Um, but that's kind of a judgment call that will depend on whoever is assessing the client. Um, but generally, you would say that these are inconclusive or automatic reinforcement. Okay, so what about this one? What does it look like is maintaining it? 
Yeah, so tangible. So what does that look like in an FA, would you say? So we didn't specifically go over this, but based on what you know about FAs, what would that look like? So they want access to tangibles. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you might either block access to the tangible or you might try to remove the tangible until they engage in foul behavior. So you say, my turn, and you go to reach out for it. The foul behavior you're looking at is them hitting you. They hit you, you stop. Now they get to keep the toy or they get to gain access to the toy if you're blocking access. Uh, what about this one? Is the demand present or absent in the antecedent? Yeah, and then they engage in the problem behavior and what happens? Yep, perfect. So if the problem behavior you're looking at is them hitting you and you present a demand and they scream, will you remove the demand? Do you think? No, yeah. So you only deliver the consequence if it's the behavior that you are looking at. So they can engage in any other problem behavior any other one that they want, but if it's not the one that you're specifically assessing, the consequence doesn't happen. So for this one, the demand stays in place if they throw something, if they flop, if they do anything else, the demand only gets removed when they hit you, if that's what you're looking at. Okay, cool, and then this is the last one. What does this one look like? Yeah, cool, so results typically are either this clear or you have that really inconclusive data that usually ends up being related to automatic reinforcement. Um, so some important things to do before and after conducting an FA. So before, you want to operationally define the behavior. Um, so it needs to be super, super clear what the behavior is. That way whoever's collecting data and whoever's kind of the assessor who's delivering the consequences can know exactly what to do. Um, that could lead to inconclusive results if you don't have a clear understanding of what the behavior is supposed to look like and you're reinforcing behaviors that aren't the uh, target behavior. Uh, you wanna make sure that all staff involved are trained on what to do. So if you are involved in the assessing process, this can include, you could be helping blocking really dangerous behavior or you could be the one presenting the consequences or the person taking data. It could be several different things, no matter what, just always make sure you feel really comfortable and confident in what your role is. Because um, like I said, one little thing could be tweaked incorrectly and the assessment can kind of be an invalid, so it's really important for everyone to be on the same page. Um, it's really important to set up safety measures. Uh, this typically involves, A, this is something that your BCBA is kind of responsible for doing, but just kind of per note, um, ruling out medical causes for behaviors, so you wanna make sure that you're not targeting a behavior that could have a medical cause behind it. And if you are dealing with a really dangerous behavior, you want to talk to medical staff, possibly have medical staff readily available, and also have constant checkups with the client because your client will be engaging in a lot of foul behavior. You want to make sure that they're safe um, and there's medical staff that are signing off on what you're doing. <coughs> so after, uh, you should plan intervention um, that focuses on replacing that problem behavior. So you did that whole assessment just so you could have a really, really clear view on what's maintaining the problem behavior. Now you'll plan an intervention to decrease that problem behavior and increase an appropriate behavior. Um, an intervention will never have just decreasing a problem behavior. There will always be a replacement behavior for that problem behavior, um, especially like if they're engaging in problem behavior to escape from demands, you wanna give them a way to communicate that they want to escape in a more appropriate way. So it might be giving a break icon or mandating for break vocally. Um, if they want attention, again, it could just be communicating to you that they want attention in a more appropriate way. Um, so you're typically gonna decrease that inappropriate behavior and then increase inappropriate behavior. Um, so common way to run an FBA in general. So this is typically what's done. Again, it, there's variations of it around there, but you'll first obtain indirect and descriptive data. Um, so Going back, this involves talking to the parents, the teachers, getting that view from their perspective, and then also observing it without intervening or manipulating anything. Um, and then you're gonna form hypotheses based on this data. So you're gonna look at all that data and say, what's super common, what seems to be the common theme? And with those hypotheses, you'll conduct an FA, you'll have your separate conditions. Um, FAs can be conducted in several ways. Um, but like I mentioned, a very common method is to do those 10 minute sessions uh, for each condition three different times. 
Um, and then you'll create an intervention based on the results of the essay. So you'll just be teaching that appropriate behavior and decreasing that inappropriate behavior. Um, so we're gonna break off into groups of four. Four, I can't see that far. Um, does anyone have questions before we do that? Yeah. Yeah. This way? definitely be like a person by person separate. basis but okay. I do think that they would probably reassess and maybe make it more general to aggression okay. um, but yeah okay. I think um, typically they'll have like different topographies of aggression because if you are dealing with these situations where they're not having access to what they find reinforcing you're gonna get kind of more explosive right. behavior. Um, so hopefully they would have planned for those different topographies okay. beforehand yeah. any other questions so we can break off into groups. You can just break off to any group. Uh, we're gonna have different scenarios. Um, what? So start back at one. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one. Okay. Ones go with Sydney. Twos go with Liz. Threes come with me. Four go with Andy. Wait, where are the papers? Are you two? Yes, you are with me. Oh no. <laughs> They're right here. Okay. <laughs>